sorry. Uh, just a second here. Why don't you just restart it? You're okay? Yeah. All right. Ready? All right. Um, we have quite a bit to do in class today. Um, I want to start just by showing you the plan. There's a lot of high-level information to try to get across in today's class. First, I do want to give you a little bit of guidance about finishing problem number 8A from the graded problem from section 2.3, um, which was the proof. So I want to give you some guidance like that. I'm not going to write out the proof for you, but I want to try to highlight the main ideas that you should talk about in the proof. Um, and also, there's an extension on that assignment. Uh, it's now going to be due until 7 o'clock tonight instead of 2 o'clock this afternoon to give the online students more time, especially, to finish it if they want to make some changes. Uh, and by the way, I do want to apologize if the video ends up being a little bit rocky sometimes, it's because we couldn't find the tripod and so we are. The camera is on top of boxes here, so it might shake a little bit, but we'll do our very best. All right, so let's come back to the plan here now. Move back to the plan. Might be better than me moving the box, I don't know. No. No? Okay. No. I want to make some comments about some real-life interpretations of the solutions, both for an interacting species models and the harmonic oscillator model. How do you understand what the solution is telling you about real life? Okay, that's the main emphasis there. I do want to review Euler's method, this time in the context of a famous example that's got an attracting periodic solution or a limit cycle. It's called the Van der Waal equation. Uh, famous because, well, it's named after somebody, so it must be famous. Make some comments as we go about existence and uniqueness for autonomous systems versus non-autonomous systems. Actually, for phase planes in two dimensions, there is something fairly significant that happens as a distinction between autonomous versus non-autonomous systems as far as uniqueness goes. We'll talk about something called the SIR or SIR model of an epidemic. S stands for susceptibles, I stands for infected people, and R stands for recovered people. The SIR model is a nice abbreviation for that. And finally, we're going to look at something called the Lorenz attractor for a special set of solutions for a special three-dimensional autonomous system instead of two-dimensional. We have to, since we got a lot of information here, we have to talk about things at a pretty high level. You're probably going to want to pay as attention as well as you can, um, and maybe watch the video on top of um, being here today. All right. What about number 8A? A great problem. You're trying to show in that problem, it's a proof, or that part of that problem, that if you take the second order equation, that's for a mass on a spring. M times the second derivative of y with respect to t plus b times dy dt plus k times y equals zero. k is the spring constant, b is the damping coefficient, and m is the mass. But if you've got two solutions of that, and you add those solutions, that you get another solution. Okay? The sum of any two solutions is a solution. That's a linearity property about this kind of differential equation. This is a linear differential equation because there are no, all the, all the function and its derivatives all appear in a sense to the first power. Okay, even though you've got twos there, that's not a second power, that's a second derivative. You're not squaring the second derivative, you're not squaring that, you're not cubing that, etc. This is a linear equation and because of that, um, that's going to be the reason why the sum of any two solutions is going to be a solution. In a nutshell, as far as calculations you need to show and what you need to assume and what you need to do, you need to start by assuming y1 of t and y2 of t are solutions. That's an assumption you need to make. See your proof? I'm putting the t's in there here initially, but I won't bother from now on putting keys in there. You need to be clear about what you are assuming though. You're assuming you've got two solutions. Your goal is to show y1 plus y2 or y1 of t plus y2 of t is also a solution. 
this is abstract. We don't have formulas for these functions. We don't know what MB and K are. We need to show it using abstract properties, in particular abstract properties of derivatives. But the idea about checking that something's a solution still holds. You plug the function into the differential equation on the left-hand side and the right-hand side and see if you get the same thing. The right-hand side is always zero, so there's really nothing to do there. The only thing to do is to plug this function, y1 plus y2, into the left-hand side, simplify, and see if you get zero, which on the face of it doesn't seem possible, does it? If we don't know what this is, how in the world are we going to get zero? What do, you, do you have any gut intuition about that? By the definition of a solution, each of those will make that equation zero. So if you use the sum rule for differentiation, you can separate it into two different things that both equal zero. Exactly. You read my mind. Exactly. You need to use your assumptions, first of all. You're assuming something. You're assuming these two things are both solutions. So when you substitute them into the left-hand side, you get zero for all t. That's an assumption you're making. You need a little bit more than that. You need linearity of differentiation, linearity of the derivative operator. For example, the derivative of y1 plus y2 is the derivative of y1 plus the derivative of y2. That works for second derivatives too. Both of those equations work. So that's a linearity property of the derivative, differentiation. So that's one thing you can quote as a reason. That's something you know is true from calculus. You're also going to need some algebra facts, technically speaking. Technically speaking, you'll need what's called the commutative property, the fact that you can rearrange things. You'll need the distributive property, the fact that if I multiply this by m as well, that I can distribute the m through. I guess I have second derivatives here. I think, okay, I'll be okay with it if you just said by algebra properties, okay? But ideally, you'd mention the names commutative property, distributive property, that kind of thing. And may also make it clear where your assumptions are used. And do write in sentences. Proofs are arguments. You give arguments with sentences, complete sentences. You are explaining why something works. Okay? So for full credit, you're going to want to write sentences, which means you may want to pick up your, re-pick up your homework assignment. Okay? If you already made the do. It's not due till 7 o'clock. Um, if you don't like the way you did it at first, just cross it off, part A, and then say part A is at the bottom, and redo it at the bottom. Okay, so these are comments from the graders too, so I'll, I'll tell the graders to make sure they are paying attention to what I said here too, as far as grade number 8A. All right, on to comments about real-life interpretations of solutions, both for interacting species models and harmonic oscillator models. I've got the Mathematica code all in here, and I'm going to use that command that I showed you last Friday, locator, which allows you to make the animation based on clicking the mouse on a crosshair symbol to move the point around, the initial condition around in the phase plane. I'm not going to explain how locator works, really, because we've got too much to do today. It's within the manipulate to make the animation. Also, again, I there are these two ways of numerically approximating solutions of differential equations in Mathematica. ND, uh, ND solve is the old way. ND solve value is the new way. Mathematica 10 and beyond. ND solve value, the second one, is easier to use because you don't have to do this extra stuff involving evaluate and slash dot, those things I mentioned last Friday. I'll show you them again today. However, based again what I found, I found that ND solve, the old one that's harder to use, is more flexible because it allows you, for example, move the initial condition around and manipulate more easily. Um, 
So let's look at the interacting species model here. Actually, let's first look at the predator prey. These are my right-hand side functions for a predator prey model, rab rabbits and foxes. I'll go ahead and enter this. Capital G here is the vector field. It's not the same as the capital G from Euler's method. By the way, the letters I use, I don't know, they're not necessarily the best yet letters to use, capital G for both of those. I'm avoiding capital F here like we usually use for vector fields because there's already a capital F in there that's an independent variable, or excuse me, a dependent variable for the differential equation, an independent variable for the vector field. You can use any cell value to nicely make solutions. However, using any cell actually in this way down here, turns out to be better in a sense, more flexible, because this is going to allow me to change my initial conditions. By putting the R0 there and the F0 there, those are the initial values of R and F, the initial rabbit and fox populations. I'm, create, I'm using any salt to create a quantity, a function really, of the initial conditions that I can plot with parametric plot and it's going to draw the solution curve and it's going to allow me to change those initial conditions. Actually, even more ideally, I do this with down here with locator, although if I do it with locator, I need the curvy braces here because locator is going to represent a point, and so I need to have an input for this be a point. Anyway, coming down to the actual graph, Let's see what we have here. This is for a predator-prey model. This is the vector field. The red arrows are arrows in the direction field, the scaled-down vector field. The black dots are the equilibrium points. We've got three of them, it looks like, there, there, and there. Don't see any others. Uh, X, I forgot, was, was that the predator or prey? I think X was probably the prey because that was a logistic model for the prey, the rabbits. And Y is probably the predator, the foxes, F. What are solutions doing? Most solutions, no matter where your initial condition is here in this first quadrant, I can move the initial condition around. Most solutions tend to head toward that equilibrium point. Okay? You should be able to say what that means about the rabbit and fox population. It means they oscillate, although the amplitude of the oscillations of their populations is settling down. And in fact, they are heading toward a horizontal asymptote if you graph them as functions of t, because this graph is spiraling in toward that point. It's a spiral sink in the phase plane. If you graph r and f as functions of time, you'll get oscillations that get smaller and smaller, and you do have horizontal asymptotes. Just like on the exam problem related to that. So you should be able to translate from that information, this, this information, to graphs of R and F as functions of time individual. What about the other kind of interacting species models? How about competing species? This was the example we considered before. Let's use locator to get full act interactivity this time. This was competing species. If the initial condition is out here, what happens? The solution, oh wow, heads toward that equilibrium point, but then goes away. How about that? Ultimately, it seems to head toward that equilibrium point. What if I change the initial condition? What if I move the crosshairs here down here? Now we head toward this equilibrium. Why not toward that one equilibrium? We, initially, it seemed like we were going pretty close. But that equilibrium seems to not necessarily be stable somehow. It seems like, for the most part, solutions are either, either going to head up toward that equilibrium point, which means x dies off, x goes to 0, and y heads toward an equilibrium of 3. So the x dies and y lives. On the other hand, for initial conditions over here, the solutions head toward this one so that x dies off, x goes to 0, and y approaches 2. 
population for y stabilizes, but x dies off. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to approach that equilibrium so they both live? Are there solutions that approach that equilibrium? Well, it would seem like maybe you could make some sort of continuity argument that perhaps there is maybe one solution curve that might head toward that equilibrium point, and in fact that is true. There will be one solution curve close to this solution curve, a little bit below it, that will head exactly toward that equilibrium point. However, finding initial conditions that give you that, equal, that um, solution are pra is practically impossible. You could experiment over and over again with different initial conditions and try to get really close, but if time was allowed to go further, past whatever time limit I've set here, most likely it would go away still. I would venture to say it's basically impossible to find exact initial conditions to give you the solution curve that heads straight toward that black dot right there and never goes away. Okay? But you can prove it exists. It's called a separatrix, okay? because it separates the plane into two different regions. One region up here of initial conditions that head toward that equilibrium point, and one that head toward this equilibrium point down there. It's a similar kind of thing if the initial populations start out low. You again mostly head toward one equilibrium point or the other. There is a separatrix, there is some solution curve that does head straight toward that <coughs> dot right there and never goes away. Finding an initial condition exactly on that solution curve is basically impossible. I would venture to say nobody in the world could do it. Okay? You could approximate points on it, but finding points exactly, I would guess it's pretty much impossible. It is a separatrix. It does exist, the solution curve, going this way toward that equilibrium point, and it separates the plane into two regions. One region there that heads toward that equilibrium point, and another region down here whose initial conditions give you solution curves that head toward that equilibrium. The moral of the story here is, according to this competing species model, most likely one species or the other dies off. Does that happen in real life? Not necessarily. These kinds of models just sort of are, are sort of more, what could you say, moral of the story kinds of models. It's possible that with competing species, one species might be likely to die off. That's kind of what you should, the lesson you should take from the model. Not necessarily that it's going to happen, because life is more complicated than these models. But it's possible. That's the lesson. That's the moral of the story. Maybe one species could die off, or the other, depending on the initial conditions. What about cooperating species? X and Y cooperate, but look, with this initial condition, they both die off. What a sad story. They aren't cooperating enough, evidently. If the initial conditions are too low, if X and Y are both too close to zero, it seems that solution curves are heading toward the origin meaning both species die off. What if they're higher? It is possible for them to live. I'm not sure why we're not seeing the solution curve here. We're getting errors. Why we're getting errors, the reason we're getting errors is because um, the solution curve is going off to infinity very rapidly. I'm not sure why we're not seeing the solution curve, though. It was showing up on my computer. Can you decrease the time? I can, yeah. I would think we would at least see some solution curves, though. Why are we not seeing it? Oh, there it is, okay. So the solution curves, when you're sort of past a certain point, are heading off to infinity in this model, as you can see from the vector field. In other words, both species grow without bound. Well, okay, maybe we need to put boundaries on them. Maybe there's carrying capacities to worry about. Evidently, with this model, there are no carrying capacities. The species both grow forever. They cooperate enough to make their populations grow forever. And the solution curve ends up going off to infinity so fast that you get errors like this. Okay? 
it's not an error in the math or Mathematica. It's just that essentially that the, the solution curves head off toward infinity really, really fast. If you graphed x and y as functions of t, it's very likely, I think, that there would be some sort of vertical asymptote in their graphs. If you graph x and y as functions of time. Does this really happen in nature? Probably not, especially the, the populations won't go to infinity in a finite time. That definitely doesn't happen. Um, again, it's just a moral of the story kind of thing. With cooperating species, if the populations are not high enough to begin with, perhaps both species will die off. There might need to be some sort of threshold populations for cooperating species for them to both flourish. That's the idea, the lesson to get out of this. And these are all things that I'm saying that you should certainly know and be able to address in homework problems and exam problems, be able to describe the real life meaning of these things. How about the real life meaning for harmonic oscillators? Quick review of the equations. Uh, first, you write the harmonic oscillator equation <clears throat> in F equals MA form, or maybe I should say MA equals F form. M times the acceleration, mass times the acceleration, is this thing. These are the two forces that are acting on the mass. We're ignoring gravity. If it, if it is an up and down mass on a spring, gravity is already taken into account by the new equilibrium position. That's what I talked about when I first talked about masses on springs. If it's left-right motion across some slippery ice, then you don't have to worry about gravity at all because the force due to the, um, the ice upward on the mass counteracts gravity. That's the force due to Hooke's law, the force due to the spring stiffness. This is the damping part. You can rearrange the equation like this or like that. And then you can write it as a first order system. By the way, in this, I don't know if you've noticed this in Mathematica, when you type things in the large font here, one and I look indistinguishable. So this is a one here, but sometimes we'll see that a one looks like is actually an I later on here today. Um, you let V equal Y prime. You define the velocity, essentially in the situation for a mass and a spring. That becomes the first equation in your system. And then your second equation is for dv dt, which is y double prime, which comes from this expression here. Even though it's technically OK to write these things in the opposite order, I would strongly, strongly suggest to never do that. To always write y first and v second. It's very important, actually, that you do that. Otherwise, you may get wrong answers when we convert this to a matrix form. If we're putting the y equation first and the v equation second, in the second equation, put y first and v second. It's technically not wrong, again, if you switch them around, but it will lead to errors when we use matrices in chapter 3. That is, that's it as a first order system. You can solve this first order system analytically using d solve value. You don't have to use n d solve value or n solve n d solve. And in fact, I did it down here. I'm going to do it with d solve value for arbitrary values of k, m, and v, and arbitrary initial conditions. Amazingly enough, even with all this arbitrariness in here, an arbitrary k, m, and v, and an arbitrary position and velocity, initial position and initial velocity, d solve value can still find a formula for the solution, though it's pretty messy looking. There it is. Yikes. However, this is great about Mathematica and copy and paste for that matter. If I want to use this crazy thing, all I have to do is copy and paste. I don't have to type it. Copy, paste. I'm defining a function. Capital Y sub, sub MBKY0 V0 of T. That's going to be a solution. Capital Y is a vector solution whose first component is little y and whose second component is little v. Do it in that order. It's, I know it's not alphabetical. y first, v second. y is going to be horizontal, v is going to be vertical in the phase plane. I copy and paste all this. It's great. To enter this function, it's going to be my solution curve. 
based on an arbitrary initial condition y0, v0. And now I can use manipulate, and once again use locator, to make an animation showing solution curves in the phase plane for different values of little m, little b, and little k. I'm calling my right endpoint of my time interval here capital B uh, because little b is the damping coefficient. So I'm departing from tradition here using capital B for my right endpoint of the time interval. Let's let time run forward. We see the solution curve heading toward evidently this sink at the origin. But it's not a spiral sink, it's not spiraling around it. <clears throat> it's heading along some curve that's getting close to being a straight line as you approach the origin. What is this telling us about the mass in the spring? Again, the y coordinate of the point, the first coordinate represents the y position of the mass in the spring. Back and forth, say across ice, y equals zero is here, y is positive over here, y is negative over here. I'm starting y out at positive, so I'm stretching the spring, and then v starts out at zero here, so I'm letting the spring go. And y is decreasing monotonically towards zero. v is negative and has a, a negative maximum speed, so to speak, right there. So there, as this mass starts to move, there will be a point in time where it's traveling fastest. So it'll speed up, and that, but then it'll slow down because now v heads towards zero as well. Sense? I'll say that again. This is really important that you get this kind of thing. This initial condition, y is zero, uh, y is one, v is zero, says I'm pulling the mass, say, one meter. It's a big mass and a big spring. One meter from its equilibrium position and letting go to rest. Y heads towards zero very slowly at first, because you know there's these y coordinates, first coordinates are not changing much. But the mass is speeding up because V is becoming more negative. It is moving to the left, and so the velocity is negative. At this moment in time, when this point is down here, that's when the speed to the left is highest. Then the mass starts slowing down, because V, while still being negative, is getting closer to zero. So the mass speeds up, but then slows down. But it never oscillates. It just comes toward the equilibrium position the original equilibrium position as t goes to infinity. What would happen if I changed, for example, the damp damping, made the damping smaller? What do you think is going to happen if I make b small, little b smaller? Got to guess? Make less damping, less friction? Mass on spring? It's going to oscillate. It's going to oscillate. How's that going to affect the phase plane? Watch it. All of a sudden, there's some sort of bifurcation, maybe. And we get some spiraling. Look at that. There's some specific value V when we go from non-spiraling to spiraling. And if I let capital B go out further, we'd see it spiral further. Maybe I should do that. Half will be go out to 20. Make little b smaller. We're going to get some spiraling. The mass is oscillating. The mass doesn't oscillate like that. Or I guess I should do it like this. It doesn't go around and around like that. It's going back and forth. It is going back and forth. It's the, the y and v values are oscillating as functions of t. And the oscillations are getting smaller and smaller in amplitude, reflecting the fact that the mass is going back and forth with smaller and smaller amplitude. y keeps track of the amplitude of the mass and the mass's oscillation that you actually physically see, y is position. But the velocity is oscillating as well. And when the velocity is negative, the mass is moving to the left. And when the velocity is positive, the mass is moving to the, to the right. So the mass is oscillating back and forth here with smaller and smaller amplitudes. When there's no damping, 
and will be a zero, which I guess I did not include actually. I should let little b go down to zero here. When little b is equal to zero, then we get periodic solutions. There's no damping, no loss of energy, mechanical energy here. Um, the mass goes back and forth forever. Solutions involve pure cosines and sines with no exponential decay. Okay? That's real important that you learn how to think about those pictures as well and interpret them in terms of the motion of mass and spring. All right, let's do a quick review of Euler's method, but this time let's do it in the context of a famous system with an attracting periodic solution. Attracting periodic solutions are also ca called uh, limit cycles. The name of this system is called the Van der Waals equation. It's in the section about <coughs> Euler's method in the book. You start it out as a second order equation. This is in the book. And the way I like to think about this second order equation is it kind of looks like a harmonic oscillator equation, a damped harmonic oscillator equation, with m equal to 1, with k equal to 1, and with b equal to, not a constant, but x squared minus 1. Now, if you pretend that that was a constant, and if it was a positive constant, that would be like a damped harmonic oscillator. You should expect solutions that are oscillating, perhaps, and decrease in amplitude. On the other hand, it's not constant for one thing, and what if it were negative? It could be negative. If x starts out close to zero, then x squared minus one is going to be negative. What happens if the damping is negative? What should we call that? <coughs> anti-damping? What happens with anti-damping? Speeds it up. Yeah, maybe it speeds it up. Maybe it makes the oscillations bigger and bigger. Maybe. You can convert this to a second order, a first order system as well by letting essentially y be the velocity, y is the dxdt. Actually, the original application of this was not to a mass on a spring, it was to an electric circuit. So x and y don't actually represent position and velocity. I'm not sure offhand what they represent, maybe current and voltage or something. In some sort of special electric circuit. But we can pretend it's a mass on a spring, and then this would be the velocity. Then the second derivative of the position, the derivative of the velocity, you'd get by solving this equation for the second derivative of x with respect to t, which equals dy dt, and you get that. Anyway, that's a nonlinear system as well. We need mathematics to help us with it. It does have only one equilibrium point at the origin. Again, I'm going to use nd solve rather than nd solve value because it gives me the flexibility to change the initial conditions. And I, again, I haven't figured out a way to do that with nd solve value. I would think nd solve value could do that, but I tried and it doesn't. It doesn't work. So this seems to be a way that nd solve is superior to nd solve value, even though it's more complicated. Even though when we use n, uh, the solution that we create with this, we have to do this extra stuff. Where is it? Uh, involving evaluate and slash dot, which stands for replace all. Don't worry about what that means here at the moment. Just realize you have to use it. If you're going to use nd solve, I guess I have to use it here as well. With nd solve value, you don't have to do those things. But using nd solve again allows me to change my initial condition. I'm using the locator down here. The coordinates of the locator, the crosshairs, are stored in PT, which is shorthand for point. I can move that, those crosshairs around with the mouse to change the initial condition. I like that flexibility. I'm also going to use Euler's method here. Here again is my capital G iterate, uh, function that I iterate for Euler's method. Uh, without explaining Euler's method again, um, let's just see what the output of this looks like. I've got two animation sliders plus a, a um, crosshairs here that I can move around because of the locator. 
those brown dots that you see are points that Euler's method is generating for a certain delta t. If I move the delta t slider to the right, that makes the time step actually smaller. I've set it up to do that if I move this to the right, watch. Initially, delta t is set at 1. I can make it smaller, and those points get closer together. You shouldn't be surprised. Delta t gets smaller, so the, approximate, the approximations that you get from <clears throat> Euler's method are going to be closer together and probably more accurate. I didn't have Mathematica connect the dots here because I wanted to see those points more clearly. What's the B? B is the time step uh, for the right end point of the solution that's generated with, with ND solve. So B effectively is time going by. <coughs> we see the solution curve going around and around as time goes by. And once again, we see it approaching, just like that example from last Friday, we see it approaching a periodic solution. And here's where we bring in the comments about uniqueness. This is an autonomous system. There's no t's on the right-hand side equations. Right-hand side functions don't involve any t's. And in that context, at least when the right-hand sides are nice enough, and they are certainly nice <coughs> functions here, Solutions, first of all, will exist for any initial condition. Remember our right side, right hand side functions, y and negative x plus 1 minus x squared in parentheses times y. Certainly nice functions, continuous differentiable, continuous derivatives. That's called continuously differentiable. Certainly existence and uniqueness theorems will apply to that situation. So solutions exist even if I can't find formulas for them. So when I use numerical methods, like Euler's method, or when I use ND solve on Mathematica, I can trust that I'm approximating actual solutions that exist. Uniqueness for autonomous systems means solution curves can't touch each other. Distinct solution curves can't touch each other. Now, you saw in the completion assignment that you can, for a given solution curve, get the same curve for different initial conditions. For this particular solution curve, where does it start? Right here. If I could start at that point, I don't know what that point is, and get this solution curve, I could start at another point on this very same curve and get essentially the same curve. It is the same curve, just starting at a different point. And that doesn't contradict uniqueness, because that's the same curve. But distinct solution curves can't touch each other. We see this solution curve approaching what appears to be a curve that looks like this. And indeed, there is a curve that looks about like that, that is a periodic solution that always come back, comes back to where it starts over and over and over again. The curve we're looking at is not that solution curve, because this solution curve starts here before it approaches the periodic solution. The periodic solution attracts it. It's called an attracting periodic solution. And it approximates it very well, but it never touches it. But for all practi practical purposes, you can't tell the difference. Okay? So there's lots of subtle points I'm making here, and they're all important. So this is why you may want to watch the video in addition to being here today, especially if you're feeling sleepy. Okay? This is not the periodic solution, but it approaches it arbitrarily closely. It never touches it. But for all practical purposes, it's so close you can't tell the difference. The graph you see here effectively is the graph of the periodic solution. Proving the periodic solution exists, though, is, is harder. You need some more advanced techniques. There's something called um, the poincare Van dixon theorem that we might be able to use to prove it exists. But we're not doing that now. We're just trusting that the picture is telling us what we think we see. But there's some subtleties you've got to think about. All solution curves except the one with the initial condition at the origin, the equilibrium solution at the origin, approach that periodic solution. It attracts all solutions except for the equilibrium point of the origin. That's the black dot in the middle of it. 
And again, Euler's method, it's not doing so hot when delta t is not very small, but when delta t gets smaller, it does better and better. Though you need more steps if you want to go off root. All right, what else? Um, I guess I'm not really taking the time to actually review Euler's method in detail and the nest list in detail because I want to get to a, a few other things here in a very short amount of time. Um, I need to finish in about 10 minutes. We did start a little late here. I'm highlighting some things, okay? And again, I'm going to highlight a couple other things that you're going to read about in more detail. I probably will talk about them some on Wednesday too, but I want to just highlight main ideas today. The next main idea I want to highlight is called the SIR model for an epidemic. SIR stands for susceptibles, infected, and recovering. People that get, say, the flu. First, you're susceptible to the flu. You don't have it, but you could get it. I, you're infected. You actually have the flu and you're not recovered, or you're recovered. There are three things, three categories we're assuming you could fall into. Now, in reality, some people could be immune to the flu strain already, or maybe they got the shot. So we're not considering those people. We're effectively imagining only these three groups of people. And we get a first order system of three equations that looks like this. S again is susceptibles, I is infected, and R is recovered people. Here I'm using a lowercase i, because even though the book uses a capital I, because if you use a capital I in Mathematica, in this font, it looks like a 1. This is the place where the 1 and the i look the same. So I'll use a lowercase i here. This is not the imaginary number i. We are going to deal with imaginary numbers in this class, but this is not it. Okay. What's the intuition behind the equations you see? differential equations. The S to T is negative alpha times S times I. By the way, S, I, and R are not actual numbers of people. I forgot to say that. They are percentages of people in the populations, which you can think of without a percent sign as being numbers between 0 and 1. 0 representing 0%, 1 representing 100%. So in all these things, S, I, and R are all quantities between 0 and 1. S is the susceptibles. Initially, before the flu starts spreading, everybody's susceptible, practically at least. S is going to be very close to 1 to start off with. And then as people get the flu, S is going to decrease. You're going to get people going into the I category, out of the S category. So S has to decrease, so its derivative has to be negative. So you see the negative sign there. The alpha is a proportionality constant. And in fact, this is a product of S and I, so it's kind of like an interaction term. It should make some intuitive sense, at least if you keep things as simple as possible, that the rate of change of the susceptibles with respect to time should be proportional to the how often susceptibles and infected people interact. The bigger the product S times I is, the more interactions between susceptible and infected people there are, thus making this quantity more negative, thus making this derivative more negative, making the slope of the graph of S more negative, okay? As you get more S and I interactions. Initially, there's not very many people in the I category, close to zero. So initially, the slope's probably pretty close to zero there. But then as more people get infected, there's more S and I interactions, and the slope becomes more negative. But probably after a while, S gets close to zero, and so perhaps the graph levels off again. Of S as a function of T. DIDT, the rate of change of the infected population with respect to I, it grows with S and I interactions at the same rate. Alpha is the same constant here, but with the opposite sign now. The I population starts off close to zero and grows as more people get infected. But some of those people recover. So to keep things simple, we add another term here, or subtract a term, add a negative term. A negative constant in front of I 
the people eventually recover. They leave the I category. And it seems reasonable when you keep things simple to make that at a rate proportional to I itself. The bigger the I population is, the more of them will go into the recovered population. We're talking about the overall populations. Beta being this constant that reflects the rate at which that happens. And the recovered population grows at that same rate, essentially. The, the relative rate of growth in terms of I has this constant beta. It's the same constant as that. Will this assume that all people are affected for the same amount of period of time? Right? Um, not necessarily, I don't think. You don't necessarily assume people recover at the same rate of time. Um, I'm not positive about that, but that, that doesn't seem like that's necessarily what follows from our assumptions. Note that if you add these differential equations, you get zero. Things cancel. That means the sum s plus i plus r has to be a constant. And in fact, that constant is a 1. OK, that's a 1 there. Because they're all between 0 and 1. They represent everybody has to go in one of the three categories. And so therefore, they have to add up to 100% of the whole population. s plus i plus r is 1. And therefore, you can actually get rid of one of these equations. You can think of it as a system of two equations, just s and i. And once you solve for s and i, you can use the fact that the sum is 1 to solve for r by just doing 1 minus s plus i in parentheses, or 1 minus s minus i. So that's nice. It reduces it to a two-dimensional system rather than a three-dimensional system. I'm going to let you read about this other stuff here and just show you a graph. Ignore the error there. Here we see the vector field. We see a blue curve that's actually going to be a solution curve, though I didn't have Mathematica actually make that curve with ND solve or ND solve value. It's actually the graph of a function, this function. You'll read about this in the book. But it turns out solution curves are on that graph. I'll let time go forward here. We see a solution curve going along that graph in that way. What's going on with real life here? The susceptible population starts off close to 1 and monotonically decreases toward, is it 0 or not? It's hard to tell. Well, it looks slightly positive there. The infected population starts out close to 0 and goes up to a maximum before it goes back down to 0. And yes, the susceptible population does not approach 0, actually. That's one of the cool things about this model. Is you it allows you to predict that, that not everybody gets the disease. They don't all get the flu in this case. Changing alpha and beta affect the shape of that curve and, in fact, affect how closely it approaches 0. And here's something else to pay attention to when you do the reading. The entire s-axis consists of equilibrium points. There's infinitely many equilibrium points along the s-axis. But the coolest thing here initially to note is that not everybody gets infected. That's a prediction of this model, is that not everybody will get infected. Final thing I want to show you today is something called the Lorentz system and the Lorentz attractor. Show you in one minute here. It is a three-dimensional system that, that cannot be reduced to a two-dimensional system. And all I want to show you here in one minute is that solutions to the system are really, really cool. I'm going to use ND solve. And I'm going to look at a solution curve in three-dimensional space. <coughs> And what does it look like? It looks really cool. OK? What in the world is that solution curve doing? This is a very famous icon in this subject here. It's called the Lorentz attractor. And if you Google Lorentz attractor, you'll see pictures of this. OK? Uh, very interesting behavior. Evidently, it's sort of periodic, but it sort of bounces back and forth between these two different circular areas, in a sense. 
weird. This is an icon of chaos, chaotic behavior. I'll have to explain what that means more in another class period. Um, I was going to say one more thing about it, but I'm forgetting. Oh, the other, the other thing I want to just mention about this was Lorenz, his original motivation for coming up with the system was to try to predict the weather. And the system was like a, a toy model of the weather. These are the right-hand side functions. Okay, don't take it too seriously as far as prediction. Okay, it was a, a sort of a little toy model of his little toy weather system. And, but the implications about it were profound. The chaotic behaviors we're gonna see, starting on Wednesday, leads to some amazing consequences about weather prediction. Basically, don't be too hard on meteorologists. It's not their fault that they're wrong a week in advance. Okay. We'll talk about that more on Wednesday. See you then.